voted in. So this, the elections were held and uh, the current committee was voted in uh, to start the Zimbabwe chapter for the SEB and are going to be working and coordinating most of the activities um, for the next year. Um, so yeah, the current committee was actually voted into, into place in August this year actually. And um, yeah, this is what they have done so far. Uh, we have uh, the vision for the chapter. Next slide. MX, next slide. Has it come through Novasutu? Are you still there, Novasutu? Right, can I, Tim, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so I will just maybe uh, continue. It, it looks like we've lost Novesutu. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please do go oh. ahead. Okay, thanks. So, um, so you don't only need to be a... So when was I? So I just spoken about the vision of the of the chapter, and um, that we actually welcome everyone who's interested in Zimbabwe's wildlife conservation. Your location does not matter. Uh, you can also still be a member of the chapter, um, and we hope that the chapter will be a place to get help and provide help for others, and also promote innovative solutions to the conservation dilemmas um, of Zimbabwe and beyond. So, so far the work that we have done is the chapter includes establishment of a website. So we have developed a website so far. Um, we're, we're going to share with you in the chat box, the link to the website um, where we have already shared some initiatives and ideas for the chapter, but also uh, being a member based um, platform, we hope that we can actually have contributions coming from you as well um, as being, being friends and also members of this chapter. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Tim has just shared the, the link to the website in the chat box. Um, so um, it is our hope that really this chapter serves as a hub for all conservationists in the country um, and also that all voices can actually be heard through this chapter and also achieve uh, certain conservation goals. So, so far the ideas that have been developed include the creation of a resource library, where we hope mm -hmm. that all the work, the academic papers that have been published, reports and uh, field work that is being carried out in the country can actually be deposited and everyone can actually access uh, and know what is happening, where and who is um, doing what. Um, there's also an initiative to spearhead a horizon scan. Um, so a horizon scan is like a foresighting project where we actually focus on the imaging issues and the intensi intensifying issues in the country. So we realize that in most of um, the way we respond to problems in the country, it is reactive other than being proactive. And most of the times are really not guided by evidence or science. So the horizon scan, we hope that it will allow us to be more proactive and to also guide our policies such that when we have any conservation issues coming up in the future, we know how best to tackle them because we are prepared and have planned for them in advance. And we have also a mentorship program that we hope that will be put into place where everyone can benefit. Um, so please, you're also welcome to submit some of your ideas as well as to what you want to, what you feel the chapter should do to achieve conservation objectives for the country. So there's an online survey. Um, can you just go to the previous slide? I'm not sure if there's a link there, uh, which is in our, on the website. So you can actually 
visit that. Or maybe Tim, if you could please um, add the link to the survey um, on the chat box. So please do feel free to contribute there, what you feel the chapter should do and uh, how best it can serve its members in the country at large. Uh, can you go to the last slide? I think it should be the last slide. Yeah, thank you. So, um, no, the previous one before that, sorry. So yeah, uh, one of the objectives as well and ideas of the chapter is to create a network of uh, global professionals uh, a platform which can enable networking and sharing of ideas because if we continue to work in silos we really might not achieve much whereas if we work together we can have a collective impact so this chapter for the Zimbabwe Society for Conservation uh, Biology really intends to bring people together professionals you could be a student but we hope that we can create a network uh, of, of um, conservationists in the country hold seminars and collaborate on researches and also really collectively come up with solutions for all the problems that we're facing in the conservation sector in the country. Um, so, so far, this is what we have um, done. And um, we really look forward to hearing from you. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so our ask is for you to join us as a member and as a friend for the chapter popularize the website, share on Twitter, Facebook, we're there. Um, I was also going to link, uh, to share the links of the website and the Twitter and Facebook page uh, in the chat box as well. And we'll also email this after the, the, the meet the, the seminar. Uh, please also go on and tell us what you want to uh, hear from us, contribute to the Horizon Scan. You know, I help us to identify the issues and also contribute, you can be a contributor, you can choose how you want to be involved in any of the work that the, the chapter is going to be involved in, and also initiate in um, work that you feel like needs to be done for conservation in the country. So yeah, we hope uh, for your active participation. And also, uh, we are looking to also get a new treasurer uh, well, looking into getting to co-opt a treasurer and develop the, the, the database mm -hmm. further. So yeah, thank you very much for joining us once again. Over to you, MX, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Novesutu. And uh, so there you are. We, we, we hope many of you have an idea of who has convened the meeting and um, our ambitions and desires going forward. Um, I just want to do a very quick introduction of David, we, who is who probably doesn't need a huge introduction to many of you. I see there are some old friends and uh, colleagues who have been in the sector for a, a long while and are quite familiar with David. Um, and uh, Richard also has just made us aware that um, we've got uh, probably the oldest uh, participant uh, on this webinar who is her 95 year old mom. So welcome um, to Mrs. Mazdob. Um, just a quick introduction of David. Uh, like I say, David is, um, is, needs no introduction. He's a distinguished conservationist, researcher, uh, practitioner, um, and many of us have known David for a very long, long time. He did his PhD at Rhodes University and from there on has been involved um, with uh, national parks and uh, uh, set up the uh, Sengwa research station for parks. And then he went on to work with WWF um, and uh, was quite instrumental in getting the office in WWF um, up and running. The one of his seminal works has been, and there are many, has been the multi-species project that he managed for a very long time. And um, uh, many of you would know about that. He's currently an honorary professor at University of Cape Town, the Fitzpatrick Institute, and continues mm -hmm. as a consultant in Zimbabwe. So if you want someone who will do 
Uh, amazing work for you, David uh, still finds time to do that. So we very delighted to have him. He was one of the original uh, councillors of the Society for Conservation Biology. So for us, it's a real privilege that we've started a chapter and he is the first person to speak in the chapter. So David, you're very welcome and thank you for um, agreeing to give this talk. I will unshare my screen and then uh, David, you can go ahead and share your screen and um, do your presentation. Thank you very much, MX, for your kind words and thank you all for being here. Um, I've not um, presented on um, Zoom before, so I hope this goes without any glitches. Um, if I can now share my screen and get on with the talk, thank you very much. Uh, we seem to have got confused here. Has that got up the first slide? It looks good. Okay, we'll carry on. Um, just an outline of the uh, talk. First of all, I'll take a, <coughs> a long view, which takes us back to Pleistocene extinctions and so on. Um, secondly, the arrival of ag agriculture in Southern Africa, which was about two and a half thousand years ago, um, with the Bantu immigration and livestock arriving here. European exploration um, and the exploitation of the game, which happened on a pretty large scale. Then move on to the three colonial periods. It's better to separate these as the B British South Africa Company period of about um, just over 30 years. And then Southern Rhodesia and the winds of change that came with really with um, Old Macmillan's talk on the docks in Cape Town, which heralded the major changes that um, took place in Africa over the next um, 20, 30 years. Independence here in Zimbabwe from 1980 to now. And then just some brief comments on wither conservation in Zimbabwe. First of all, let's start with a long view. I've put up a diagram there of, um, which sort of summarizes some of the last 2 million years of evolution of hominids. And about 170,000 years ago, the so-called mitochondrial Eve with the beginnings of modern humans. 250 years, 1,000 years ago, um, anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Things we don't have a good handle on, um, at least I'm not aware of them, are the use of poison and when that started, because that would have made a big difference to um, hominid hunting ability, the use of fire to modify environments, and also when the hunting of elephants actually started. 1.8 million years ago um, in Kenya, there's the earliest subsistence use of proboscideans, um, but it's not known at that stage whether they were killing proboscideans or whether um, they were feeding on or using um, carcasses of animals that had died of other carcasses. And then of course, 2,600, 2.6 million years ago rather, um, the earliest use of stone tools, um, Homo habilis. And it's important to note that even Australopithecines were able to spiral fracture um, long bones, which is quite a tricky procedure to get at the marrow. What predators were around? In the Miocene and Pliocene, there were giant, giant hyenas and saber-toothed cats. These were very large animals in the region of 1,000 kilograms. But the Pleistocene saw the emergence of hominids and the displacement of saber-toothed cats, many of which were very large. And Homo erectus with stone tools and fire and Homo sapiens only coming in very late in the, in the, in the situation. But two million years ago, we had um, five genera and nine species of proboscideans. By the middle Pleistocene, three genera and five species, and we ended up um, now with one genus and two species. And the hypothesis is that hominids 
um, had a major role in um, bringing about the, the loss of these large animals. <clears throat> a more recent um, thing, 5,000 to 13,000 years ago, this is a depiction of a sand depiction on a painting in the Matopas of sand hunting elephants. And clearly hominids have hunted mammals from rodents to elephants and impacted ecosystems for a million years or more. So that there's been continual change. We often talk about pristine environments, but these pristine environments or so-called pristine environments have been changing and have been modified by hominids and humans for a very long time. So we get onto my reflections. And the reason I used reflections is because I'm not a historian and it's not meant to be a, a serious um, scholarly history of what's happened in Zimbabwe, but sketching out various periods and changes. So the question is, was conservation and sustainable use of natural resources a part of early cultures? It seems unlikely. If it had been, why did hominids move out of Africa and contribute to the major extinctions of mega megafauna elsewhere in the world? If we'd been comfortable with sustainable use and living a happy, sustainable life here in Africa, I'm not sure we would have moved out. Agriculture and the Bantu migration, um, that came from West Africa. I assumed down through East Africa, this is a map really of the movement of livestock into cattle into Africa. That started 7,000 years ago and cattle arrived in Southern Africa about two, two, two and a half um, thousand years ago. But some recent, very recent work in the last couple of months that's been published based on genetic analysis of populations in Africa suggests that they may, that people may have in fact moved down, down the west coast from through Angola into southern Africa. Pre-colonial natural resource management. There were traditional norms and practices across cultures in southern Africa. Um, these involved the use of plant resources, traditional medicines, and also poisons. Many families um, across many of the cultures have their family names after totem animals. Jlovo is one, um, and Porfo for an eland is another. And what animals could be hunted when and where by whom? For example, Mziligazi and Lobangula um, restricted hunting areas and had rules for hunting in those areas and elsewhere. Um, they imposed permits and fines on European hunters who came into their territory. And they also um, mobilized chiefs and led mass hunting operations. There's the well-known um, golden rhino from Mapungubwe, which was in one of the um, graves in Mapungubwe. And that gold-plated thing dates back to about a thousand years or more. Just an artist depiction of um, a hunt, and this was apparently in Botswana. And People erected these massive stockades down to the pitfall traps down at the bottom there in which they drove animals and had these widespread um, game drives with pitfall traps and circling herds. The Shona also used to use um, very large nets and have periodic drives which were stopped in about um, 1911 and Sulu was known to have opposed the government's moves to um, stop that sort of use of wildlife. Pre-colonial trade in, in wildlife. Arabs and Asian, Arab and Asian trade off the east coast of Africa took place for, for a long time and trade in ivory from Mapungubwe was dated back to about a thousand years ago. Um, once the Portuguese rounded um, the Cape and started um, working and um, trading on the west, on the east coast of, of Africa, um, the ivory trade got going there. And that graph shows the um, around 100 tons of ivory going out um, a year from the ports from Mozambique, Zanzibar, and so on. And then that very tall um, figure there was um, more recently, in the early 1880s, 
with the global trade in ivory and um, close to a thousand tons of ivory leaving, um, leaving Africa. In 1887, it reached, and this is work from Clive Spinach, it reached something like a thousand tons leaving Africa. And of course, by 1887, shortly after that, the elephant populations of Africa collapsed. The ivory trade was also associated with um, the trade in slaves. Um, people needed to transport their ivory from way inland in Africa to a coast. And when they reached the coast, both slaves and ivory um, tended to be sold. Some reflections on that pre-colonial period. Hunting and trade were clearly an important part of pre-colonial agro-pastoral communities and meat was provided by hunting rather than from domestic stock. So humans were using wildlife and um, large mammals um, very widely across, um, certainly across Southern Africa, if not the rest of Africa. Some controls existed in these stratified societies, but clear evidence of preservation and conservation other than for the benefit of, elite, of an elite class is, is lacking. And on reflection, in many ways, that is still happening today when we think about the way um, wildlife is being used, um, the way that um, our protected areas are being used, really they're there and being locked up for um, an elite class and their use. And for the most part, um, peasants have, and many are still being excluded from the use of wildlife. <clears throat> European exploitation and the exploitation, exploitation of game. The great trek north in the 1830s from the Cape um, further opened up um, Southern Africa, particularly to so-called sport hunting expeditions and exploration. And the explorers covered their costs by providing meat along the way and by recovering hides and ivory, which for the most part were then um, exported. For example, West Beach and Phillips exported 30,000 pounds of ivory between 1871 and 76, a period of five years from Pandamatenka where they had, where they had their base. And that amounted to about 3,000 elephants. Courtney Salou in 1872 and his party took out 4,400 pounds of ivory from Northwest Matabililand, the Wangi Matetsi area and that accounted for about 400 elephants. In 1887, as I mentioned earlier, um, some 100,000 tons of ivory was exported from Africa and the populations effectively collapsed. <clears throat> there were probably somewhere in the region of 8,000 8, elephants south of the Zambezi Kuneni rivers. And in Zimbabwe, my estimates are that it probably got down to about 4,000 elephants, if that. This slide shows the distribution of tsetse flies. And the tsetse free zone was in the higher altitudes and tsetse covered a very large part of the country, which of course excluded um, livestock and also impeded much of the um, movement of hunters and their horses and so on. <clears throat> The Rindipus pandemic of 1896 killed cattle, wild bovids, and tsetse fly and reduced them to, again, very low numbers. It was a major uh, like decimation of things. The map there shows tsetse fly restricted to a few isolated pockets in the north of the country. Um, this area here was Hartley. And it was in these areas that um, once the tsetse started, um, expanding again, um, tsetse control hunting started. So by 1887, elephant populations in Southern Africa had collapsed. Bryden reported that they were about to become extinct south of the Zambezi. And then given the high levels of hunting of other game and the Rindapest pandemic, by 1900, the numbers of most species were at very low levels, as I mentioned just now. And of course, the greatly reduced distribution of tsetse um, which depended on mammals for their food, um, bore testimony to, to this conclusion. <clears throat> so 
Sorry, I think we went back there. <clears throat> Colonial period, um, 1890 to 1923, the colony experienced the collapse of a wide range of big game species. In May, Dr. Sara, who is a member of the um, administra administration, established, proposed establishing a national park along the lines of Yellowstone National Park in the USA, but it was rejected by the Legislative Council. By 1900, um, there was considerable concern over the loss of game, which revealed the need for improved legal provisions. The last rhino, for example, was shot in the area in um, 1920. In order to deal with the issue of protecting game, the Game Laws Amendment Act of 1886 from the Cape of Good Hope um, was used by the administration. That um, legislation included different classes of game, birds, antelope, royal game. Royal game could only be hunted um, for scientific purposes and required the administrator to issue that permit. Hunting was limited to the dry season. In 1914, private landholders could shoot any mammals on their land for a one pound permit. Of course, a one pound at that stage was worth a lot more than it is today, but nevertheless, it um, provided an indication of the state at which people could hunt on their land. And the control of tsetse fly by game elimination um, in open hunting areas started in 1915 in Hartley and the Subungu. Rupert Jack, who is the entomologist who um, concluded that since the rinderpest had more or less eradicated tsetse fly, um, hunting out the animals would achieve the same um, objective. He was quite an amazing person actually. He, he would travel by train from Harare to um, Kodoma, um, hire a group of, um, of people to travel with him, walk across from Kodoma to Get, right across the Subungui area, um, scouting out for Tsetse and so on, and then catch the train from Get back to Harare. Um, I'm not sure there are many entomologists who would be doing that sort of journey today. <clears throat> the act was administered by the Department of Agriculture and of course um, agriculture was put in much priority compared with wildlife. So reflections during that British South Africa company period, um, the interests were mainly in mining and agriculture which predominated in the early stages. There was a shift later on with a focus on mining from mining to agriculture and the export of beef during World War I. Game preservation laws were inadequate and in fact had little impact. And it was concluded that farming and game were not compatible, um, which again, apart from the tsetse control operations, um, led to um, the tendency just to wipe out what game animals were um, large mammals and wildlife there was on farms and ranches because they were seen to be competing with cattle. We then move on to the colonial period of self-government, self-government which came in place, took place in 1923-24. Um, and then the major drivers of change over the next um, 25 years were really human population growth, the Land Apportionment Act, which of course created um, a dual agricultural system, which is still with us today, and um, sidelined a very large part of the population. There was agricultural expansion um, in the com commercial farming areas, the so-called alienated land, and also the control of animal diseases, um, which again impacted on large wild mammals. However, game reserves and national parks were created, um, Rhodes Matopas in 1926. I've got a question mark there because it's not very clear to what extent um, it actually was set aside as a, as a protected area um, at that stage. 1928, Wanky, Robbins and Urungui and Gonorazo were established as game reserves. Urungui and Gonorazo were later deproclaimed. 
um, I haven't been able to disco discover just when that happened or why that happened, um, but it did. And then in 1932, the Victoria Falls and Kazuma Pan were declared as um, game reserves. And then 1933, Rose and Yanga Estate. The National Parks Act only came into being in 1949. Um, and in the 1950s, added 10 small parks, which were centered on large dams, um, like um, what was called McElwain and Asna Chavira. Um, these were later re gazetted, if you like, into recreational parks rather than national parks. The Federation was formed, I think, in 1952, but the Federal Government National Parks Board was only appointed in 1958. And that was when the first annual report of national parks, because national parks in the country fell under the federal government, not the local government. Um, the first annual report was only produced there. So there was a sort of period of hiatus, if you like, during the, during the 1950s. Non-hunting reserves um, were declared in 1958 in Chisarira, Matusadona, and the Urungui, um, which is now in Yakisakana, which having been declared earlier was again, became a non-hunting reserve. And that was under the Game and Fish Preservation Act in 1929. Part of my focus on the legislation and the act is because these provide the markers of what was the policy that evolved from them in relation to the management and conservation of wildlife. The London Convention um, of 1933, um, which was called the Convention Relative to the Preservation of Fauna and Flora in their natural state, in the colonies throughout Africa, and the British colonies at least throughout Africa, um, had a major impact on um, conservation, but not a great impact for some reason in Southern Rhodesia. And the major points that emerged from that were by, by the constitution of national parks, strict nature reserves, and so on, the hunting, killing, or capturing of fauna, and the collection of or destruction of flora and fauna shall be limited or prohibited by the institution of regulations concerning the hunting, killing, and capturing of fauna outside such areas, and the regulation of traffic and trophies. Um, even in those days, um, trophies and trophy hunting um, was obviously an issue. And by the prohibition of certain methods of and weapons for the hunting, killing and capturing of fauna, um, such as the use of particular weapons of particular caliber for hunting a particular species, um, no hunting at night with, with the lights and that sort of control. Further key developments were the Natural Resources Act of 1941 by um, Judge Robert McElwain. Um, that was promulgated because of the levels of destruction, soil erosion, deforestation, and so on, that was taking place on commercial farms throughout the country. Um, it was an act that had a major impact on conservation one way or another through the, throughout the country, and also created the um, the name slips my mind for the moment, the um, conservation areas in the farming areas, which provided a local watchdog over um, conservation, not only of soil erosion and deforestation, but also of wildlife. In 1952, a game sanction was created. This fell under the entomological branch in the Division of Agriculture. And it comprised a game officer who was Archie Fraser, plus a game clerk and a vermin ranger. And the three of them were responsible for the management and conservation of wildlife throughout the country, except in national parks. And in his first annual report, um, this is a summary of four points that came out of Archie Fraser's first annual report. Um, administration of Game and Fish Preservation Act um, was to be adopted from the Forestry Act, and that was what he would be using. He consolidated existing, existing legislation to better control activities of hunters and regulations for tsetse control. Um, presumably there were no um, regulations before then. Gazetted proclamations concerning fish introductions, 
um, he commented that existing legislation was outdated, inadequate, difficult of enforcement, and that new, le new legislation was urgently required. And he set about doing that, and in the end ended up, Archie Fraser that is, um, having a major influence on the legislation regarding wildlife in this country. Um, this was a photograph of Rupert Fothergill of um, Operation Noah, Robert Treadgold, Garfield Todd, who was the Prime Minister at the time, and Archie Fraser on a visit to Barna Pools in October 1956. <clears throat> Further developments occurred not long after that. Um, Ray Smithers was concerned at the continuing loss of wildlife in the country, and he invited three Fulbright scholars to the country to investigate wildlife management. And they were Dasman, Mossman, and Thane Riney. The following quote comes from um, a paper by Dasman, Dasman and Mossman. And I read it. When we came to Southern Rhodesia in September 1959, we were dismayed by the apparent scarcity of game over large areas of the country accustomed to seeing good numbers in the ranching and farming lands of, of America, we were not prepared to travel hundreds of miles through Rhodesian farms and ranches without seeing wildlife. And again, that um, echoed the off-stated um, comment, particularly from the director of veterinary services, that you can't ranch cattle in a zoo. And very much of that was also to do with the control of animal diseases. So some reflections on that period of 1923 from um, self-government to 1959. The continuing loss of wild animals and plants, increasing awareness of the need for preservation, the influence of international conventions and movements, um, particularly the 1933 London Agreement, the Natural Resources Act and the ICA movement, Intensive Conservation Area Movement, um, is the name of the um, institution that I struggled to remember a moment ago. The creation of a game section, which became the Department of Game and later the Department of Wildlife um, by 1960, and also the creation of national parks and reserves. So there were positive movements during that period. And game ranching started, um, primarily on Doddyburn and Buffalo Range in the southeast of the country. And what that did was provide a value for wildlife on private land. We then move on to the colonial period of winds of change. In the early 60s, there was a major move to Look at was led prominently by, um, by Huxley, that Africa's wildlife should be able to produce protein for um, a protein starved population in, um, in Africa. So that there is a lot of research on game cropping schemes, on um, body composition of animals and so on. There were changes in wildlife legislation and development of game ranching on private lands in Southern Africa. Um, the Wildlife Conservation Act of 1961 facilitated game reserves, private game reserves, non-hunting reserves and game ranching. And then in 1963-64, the National Parks and Wildlife Conservation Departments merged to create the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management. And that brought in the 1975 Parks and Wildlife Act of which Archie Fraser was the primary architect um, together with Graham Child. And that rationalized the categories of protected areas. So we ended up with strict national parks of which there were 11, safari areas, 17, five sanctuaries, recreational parks, botanical reserves and botanical gardens. The most significant um, aspect of that act was that it conferred appropriate authority on landowners. So landowners and occupiers of land became what was known as the appropriate authority for managing wildlife on their land. They could do so without permits. Um, and at the time there was considerable resistance 
to it because it was felt that um, farmers would just um, get rid of their wildlife and there were no controls. There was a, um, a measure in there and that the minister could prohibit or put a hunting ban on any property where he felt um, they were abusing it. And he could do that without giving any reasons whatsoever. The result was that um, wildlife ranching and um, protection on private land throughout the country really took off once um, landowners were made responsible for their wildlife. That resulted in increasing demand for sport hunting and safaris, the resumption of tsetse control, um, and this time not on all species, but on six selected species, which were elephant, um, buffalo, warthogs, bush pigs, kudu and bushbuck, which were the primary hosts of tsetse. By that stage, people could, um, it was possible to identify what animal um, tsetse flies had fed on. Um, recently fed tsetse, tsetse's were squashed onto a bit of filter paper, which was sent off to Purbright in the UK, and they were able to identify which species the blood came from. It also led to the growth of game ranching. Um, Importantly, four game reserves were established in the communal land in 1968. Those were um, Chirisa, Dandy, Ruya, and Malapati. At that stage, um, the Ministry of Internal Affairs were the appropriate authority for wildlife um, on the communal lands. And the whole intent at the time of establishing those game reserves was that they should provide benefits to the people um, neighboring those reserves. Um, for a variety of reasons that didn't really happen, except in the case of Chirisa, where the elephant culling program, Project Windfall, which stood for Wildlife Industry for All, um, provided a, a meat to um, people in the neighboring areas. It also led to the establishment of safari concessions and communal lands and returns from those hunting concessions to um, what was called the African Development Fund and to rural district councils. Excuse me. We then come to the more recent period of 40 years, independence, 1980 to um, 2020. In 1981, Zimbabwe acceded to CITES and later to other international con conventions. As a result of the unilateral declaration of independence, of course, Southern Rhodesia was barred from any of these conventions. In 1982, Campfire was proposed, and in fact, Treasury allocated a reasonable sum of money for its implementation. But it was only in 18, 1989 um, that it was in fact adopted by government and three districts were granted appropriate authority status and households began to derive direct benefits um, from wildlife. Campfire program generated considerable interest um, in the region um, with the uptake of CBRM, which then spread to um, neighboring countries in various forms. In 1984, major conservancies were developed in the Southeast Lowfield, um, Savi Valley Conservancy, Bubiana, Bubi Valley, and Chiridzi. Chiridzi is um, no longer there, but the others have survived and are still operating. The Ministry of Natural Resources, however, in 1995, began to re-centralize control um, and wildlife decisions were being made by the ministry rather than the director of national parks and wildlife management. The act in fact specifically at that time made it clear that decisions on the management of wildlife would be made by the department and not by the ministry. In 1998, um, a statutory instrument, statute instrument 21, further centralized control and that's a major bone of contention to this day, um, since it, in effect, went against the primary legislation. It was a statutory instrument um, that was not in keeping with the primary legislation and should have been challenged on that ground, but um, never was, and probably if it had been, wouldn't have been successful anyway. 2000 and the years following that saw land distribution initiated by the state um, the demand for wildlife-based initiatives declined, um, tourism declined by 75%, and sport hunting interesting by 10%. In 
One of the aspects relating to sport hunting and safari hunting is that it's far more resilient to um, issues relating to tourism than photographic and ordinary nature-based tourism. <clears throat> Wildlife habitat, of course, fra fragmented in the large scale commercial farming areas and numbers of wildlife in very many parts of the country declined drastically. That graph um, indicates that the budgets in US dollars that were available um, to um, national parks. And there was just a massive decline um, during the 1990s, so that by 2000, um, National Parks was operating on somewhere around 10, maybe 20 US dollars per square kilometer. And also when the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority was formed um, to really fend for itself financially, um, it faced a $20 million debt. So that that early period of the 2000s was a very difficult period for um, national parks. This map just shows the extent of wildlife land in the country, um, national parks, um, with major conservancies in the Southeast Lowfield. These areas in, in yellow are really the campfire wards and not all of that land is in fact um, wildlife land. But nevertheless, it covers a very considerable area of the country. There was also in 2001, the development of transfrontier conservation, conservation areas and Zimbabwe is um, responsible for five within the country. Um, Kaza, Mapungubwe in the south, um, Great Limpopo, um, Chimani Mani, and um, one up in the northeast of the country um, with Zambia. During the 2006-2014 era, poaching of elephants in the Zambezi Valley took off. Um, the elephant population in the Subungu, for example, declined from about 15,000 to 3,500 elephants. And in the lower Zambezi Valley from 19 to 11,000 11, elephants. Um, that's been brought under control since and the population is, is still, still growing. 2016 to 18, there was a review of parks, um, forestry and the environmental manage, um, management agency, and also of campfire. Um, Cecil the Lion um, incident, of course, increased pictures from animal rights organizations across the country and across Southern Africa for that matter. And in contrast for managing selected national parks, Gonorizo and Matusa Donna um, have um, taken place. Um, the Frankfurt Zoological Society um, has partnered with national parks to manage Gonorizo and Africa Parks are, um, have now a contract to manage Matuzadona National Park. The review of Campfire took place in 2018 and produced um, pretty comprehensive CBNRM policy, which focused on the devolution, as was the original intention of Campfire, the devolution of appropriate authority for the management of wildlife and all natural resources to the local level, uh, probably the ward producer um, level. Um, that policy was finally approved by cabinet um, two months ago. Um, and we've yet to see to what extent that may have an impact on the resuscitation of CBNRM in the country, which has reached a pretty low ebb um, for the moment. There's some major gaps that still need to be filled um, in terms of the history, and just run through those quickly, the role of conservation related societies, professional associations, NGOs, and so on. And there's a, a rich field of scholarship that's required to bring all those up to date. Some reflections on the last 40 years, it's been a period of gains and losses, parks and wildlife estate has remained more or less intact, and five um, transfrontier conservation areas are being developed, um, and that's going fairly well. Conservancies added substantially to the land under wildlife, that should be in the 1980s, not 1908. 
but some were lost after 2000. The population of 2000 black rhino in the Zambezi Valley is no more, but rhino populations are still being maintained um, pretty effectively in some of the conservancies. And then of course, some elephant populations, as I mentioned, were reduced in 2006 to 2014. The most worrying development um, has however been the recentralization of controls and the failure to develop and implement innovative policies to support conservation-based land use and livelihoods beyond the parks and wildlife estate. There are enormous opportunities in the rest of the country, um, particularly in the more arid areas of the country, to develop um, wildlife-based land uses, um, which would improve livelihoods and well, as well as contribute to the national fiscus. Um, this may, however, change if the new CBNRM policy is fully implemented. So that raises a question of whether we're life conservation in Zimbabwe. Um, just a summary diagram of where we've come from. In the early um, 1900s, protecting the game and setting up game reserves, protected areas for public enjoyment and benefit, really resulting from the 1933 London, London Convention. Then a focus on outdoor recreation and biodiversity conservation in its fullest sense only came in quite recently. And then of course, now um, conservation as an engine for climate change adaptation and rural development. Um, and that has become a major focus in recent years. We face presently an increasingly uncertain climate and a continuing human population growth with greater pressures on our natural resources. Our wildlife provides a global comparative advantage and it could greatly, greatly increase returns to livelihoods in the national economy and the dry lands of the country. Some of the key issues um, and of course, there are many more than I've listed here. Budgets for conservation are a primary constraint. Peter Lindsay's recent paper in um, Panis indicated that you needed 1 billion a year to conserve lions in all of the protected areas in which they occur in Africa. And really the budget to fully protect areas in Africa requires in the region of $1,000 per square kilometer or more. And of course, um, for most protected areas, the budgets are very, very much lower than that. We also need to find ways of securing land tenure and resource access rights for direct investment, both at a national and a foreign level for conservation. The country has declared and the president has declared the country is open for business, but in relation to conservation and the ability for um, direct foreign investment, um, that isn't in place yet. And then scale sensitive governance of natural resources and ecosystem services are very badly needed to facilitate active adaptive co-management and implementation of community-based natural resource management in the country. With centralized controls, both at national level and at district council level um, are almost certainly impeding the development of effective community-based natural resource management in the country. And then finally, just some thoughts on what role for conservation biologists and ACB. Um, you've outlined um, earlier this afternoon an admirable um, vision and set of objectives and so on that you um, intend to follow and uh, sincerely hope that that you will be able to do that, that many of us will join you and help you in accomplishing that. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused crises and opportunities, not only for us here, but globally. And it would be perhaps useful very soon to explore alternative plausible futures and scenarios and what opportunities may arise um, as a result of the pandemic, particularly here in the country, but also elsewhere. Ecosystem health and services and their value at local and national levels. There have been an almost complete um, absence of any serious work and consideration 
of the value of ecosystem services and their importance in this country. And I think that's an area that really needs um, serious attention. Conservation paradigms. Many aspects of conservation in the country are still focusing on species, some on populations, less on ecosystems, and even less looking at linked social ecological systems as a unit which is operating. And of course, we need to put greater um, emphasis on evidence-based conservation. Another area um, which I think is very important and which you have in fact highlighted in your um, schedule of work is education and awareness. Tertiary level training and curricula, to what extent are these really dealing with the issues that need to be dealt with in terms of training? Secondary and primary school levels where um, the syllabuses may well be outdated in terms of a modern view of what conservation biology and conservation is about. And then of course, public and sustainable use issues and particularly how we deal with the um, mounting pressures from animal rights organizations elsewhere in the world that are opposed to sustainable use and benefits from wildlife. And of course that raises all sorts of issues concerning ethics and um, their relationship with conservation. So thank you very much indeed um, for that. And I'm happy to take any questions if there's, there's some time for that. <clears throat> Thank you, David. And as Holly has just uh, indicated on the chart, this would be a hard act to follow for whoever comes next um, on, on these uh, seminars that we're doing. Um, just want to, to open to, to questions. I think uh, I'm not too sure whether we do have, Nobesu, to any questions um that have come through on the chat if there isn't as you probably got through them i just wanted to 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 start with one david mm -hmm. it's it's quite apparent that uh during just before 1980 and actually 1980 to probably 90s thereabout there was quite some innovation um that that happened within the country um, in your view, are there any particular uh, reasons why there was such a um, forest where were being designated and campfire as an idea, the conservancies were coming on board? Was there a particular uh, reason or any factors in your mind that may have been um, uh, 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 motivating factors for all that? Yes, I think with independence, there was great excitement in the country across all sectors and across all races that the war was finished. We could now get on and do some useful things. And also there was more money available. Um, many of the aid agencies came in. Um, and so there was a, a period of very considerable excitement of moving forward. And I think that generated quite a lot of the initiatives and moves and progress that occur. Sorry, on mute. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think team and um, Nobisutu, any questions that have come through? Yeah, we do have a question from Richard Mastop. Um, he's asking how one can access the CBNRM 2020 policy document. Um, I have a copy. <laughs> and um, Sat, that's um, Sat and Chap Masterson who ran the review of Campfire Project will have copies. What I can do is ask him if I can pass a copy to you and you can put it on your website. That would Great. be lovely, David. Thank yeah. yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, 
And no. Richard, I can, I can certainly send you a copy directly, but um, whether to make it fully publicly available, I think it is publicly available. It just went up to cabinet. I don't know to what extent it was modified between the ministry and cabinet, um, but cabinet made a very strong statement about, um, and this was only three or four weeks ago, strong statement about national parks taking control of the issue of updating their the Parks and Wildlife Act to, um, to mesh with the 2013 constitution. Many of the acts in the country haven't been um, updated to um, reflect the provisions of the um, new constitution. And also strong mention of devolution, which is a central aspect of that CBNRM policy. However, um, I and others have detected some considerable resistance from rural district councils um, about the devolution. And so we've yet to see how it may play out. Excellent. I have another question here from Diane. Could you expand on the skills that are needed as we move forward beyond traditional conservation biology to work on community conservation and in particular on ecosystem services? Yes, one of, one of the things, I guess, that um, shapes those that come into conservation biology is that they've been trained as either zoologists or botanists and soon find themselves having to deal with a whole range of social issues. And there are two ways one can deal with that. One is either to get develop the skills yourself or to form teams that combine those skills. At the early stages of campfire, um, what happened was that there was a campfire collaborative group established, which included Marshall Murphy and the Center for Applied Social Sciences from the university to deal with the social issues. Um, Africa Trust um, dealt with many of the financial um, um, development issues and WWF dealt with the ecological issues. And between the three groups of people, that collaborative group um, had, a, had an important influence on the development of the early development of campfire, along with national parks, of course. I'm not sure that that answers the question more specifically. Um, I put in there social ecological systems. And one of the things that perhaps all of us need to bear in mind is that when we're dealing with um, any of the developments relating to conservation, we need to be looking at both the ecology and the social systems that are involved because they're very closely linked and um, strong interplay between them. In relation to ecosystem services, the two aspects of that, one is monitoring and, evalu and um, establishing just what those ecosystem services are. That's reasonably straightforward. The difficulty comes in in valuing them. Um, and particularly when thinks about carbon sequestration and how the benefits and so on can flow from that. But there are a full range of other ecosystem services. And to what extent can just the presence of lions and elephants, which people can view and enjoy, um, be considered an ecosystem service and how the um, benefits from those can be um, obtained and dispersed to to those people who are looking after them. So I guess the skills will require not only um, ecology, biology, but also a full range of social sciences and also um, financial and economic aspects. Exactly. Okay, we have another question uh, from Victor. Um, He's saying, uh, last slide is an aspect of education and awareness. Could you possibly suggest some critical issues that may need to be mainstreamed into tertiary uh, curricula towards evidence-based conservation? It would also be nice to have an overview of how tertiary curricula has evolved over time and some of the gaps that we still need to address as a country. I 
I suspect that part of the problem may be that if one looks at the curricula and what is being taught in schools, that it may be in relation to conservation, perhaps rightly initially at a very elementary stage, but I'm not sure that, that the current paradigms of conservation and the fact that it includes much more than just looking after particular species um, is being dealt with in the curricula that, that are, are obtaining in, um, in the schools. One of the interesting things that is developing is that, for instance, um, the Lowfeld Rhino Trust and one of the carnivore groups are spending a lot of time and developing educational materials on predators and rhinos and so on, which are being distributed in schools um, at the primary school level so that people have a much stronger idea or a much better idea of what conservation of those animals is about. The extent to which their materials are being used, uh, if you like, in, in urban and um, other rural schools, I'm not sure. But I'm not able to answer your question fully right now at the moment. I'd have to give it much more thought. Yeah. Okay. Another one from the left field, um, David, is, is, and I know Peter, Peter Chigana is probably uh, more technology focused. He, he asks, do you view technology as the limitation or culture as being the major hurdle in progressing uh, conservation, assuming the economic situation in the country improves? <coughs> I think it's both. Um, there are a whole range of cultural issues um, which perhaps could be modified or changed or updated if people had better information about conservation and about wildlife. And one thought comes to mind, for instance, the invertebrate populations in this country are crashing at an enormous rate. Just 10 days ago, I drove 1,500 kilometers down to the Bite Bridge area and back. My windscreen had hardly any um, splashes of insects on them. 20 or 30 years ago, I would have had to stop and clean that windscreen several times on a journey like that. Um, so there are those sorts of issues that are just not being tackled. And again, a lot of that is probably related to cultural aspects of how people view nature, the full range of nature, natural resources. But on the technical side, there are enormous changes taking place now in the use of um, technology and particularly of um, drones. Just this morning, um, an article arrived on my desk where they've been able to use drones and program them to count, to photograph, and also that ended up counting, a vast um, colony of penguins. It took three, three hours instead of three or four days in the most incredible bad weather for people to do it in the way they used to do it. And I'm sure that a whole lot of our survey techniques, monitoring and so on could be greatly improved by the use of drones and, photo and using them as, um, if you like, uh, providing the photographs necessary to monitor things. How many of us have spent, spent days measuring dozens and dozens of plants along transit to track what elephants are doing to vegetation? Whereas you could put a drone up to a couple of hundred feet and get a photograph of a hectare, which you could repeat year after year and make all the measurements you needed on that. Something would be lost undoubtedly by doing that. Um, you wouldn't have the hands-on experience of actually handling all those things. But nevertheless, the technology is there and could be used. Excellent. We shall have a few more questions. Last 
probably the last two, uh, Nobesu two. Um, there's a question from Clarice. Um, so saying, what is the role of heritage-based wildlife management as we develop these new strategies and policies? By heritage-based management, I guess you mean um, indigenous cultures and indigenous knowledge. Um, Clarice, would you like to clarify that? She says yes. Yes, that's exactly what he what she means. Yeah. yeah. I think particularly when working on conservation projects at a local village ward level, um, one very definitely needs to take full account of the local culture, indigenous knowledge, and how people feel about their resources. Because if you don't do that, um, what you're trying to accomplish and so on certainly won't work. Um, there was some very interesting work done several years ago by Alois Mandondo about cultural relations to particular plants. And those could vary from one ward to the next. So one needed to be very sensitive at the extent to which um, those, if you like, cultural aspects and heritage aspects um, may differ from place to place. Thank you, David. The last one I think is from um, Christo. Christo is asking, I think a particularly pertinent one uh, in light of some of the issues that the country faces around agriculture. And he asks, given that wildlife and agriculture are so intertwined, how would you describe the synergy between agricultural and conservation authorities in the country? <clears throat> I don't think there is a very strong synergy, at least I'm not aware of it. And one of the problems that one faces where you have centralized control of so much is that you have these um, I was struggling for the word um, things, these silos in which agriculture operates, in which um, conservation operates, and they seldom meet. And of course, there's a great need to, to move across that divide. And one of the things that um, certainly we're trying to do in the, in the Southeast Local, I'm presently engaged in assessing the possibility of establishing a biosphere reserve in parts of the Southeast Local that may link, for instance, Booby Valley with um, Gona Reserve, is that one really needs to look very carefully at the ways that we can integrate um, wildlife, if you like, um, biodiversity conservation, intensive crop production, and livestock production. And there are ways of doing this, um, but it's going to need a fair amount of um, work and research, and also um, cooperation, if you like, um, at the very local level. Um, And that, that just at the moment isn't all that easy to achieve. Wow, that's an interesting one. Um, do you think um, regenerational uh, agriculture and grazing uh, are gaining any traction, particularly related to soil health? That's not my question, by the way, it's uh, Richard Ferguson's question. I'm not sure that that's happening at any large scale, but there's um, a project being developed um, in the Bight Ridge district, which is really looking very closely at doing just that. Um, there you have two ranches which were up for resettlement. Um, the communities in fact moved off those and are back in their, in their neighboring wards, but still have, if you like, a claim to the management and resources of those two ranches. And, um, 
they're definitely thinking of moving very definitely in that direction. Right, excellent. Thank you so much, David. This has been such an enlightening uh, talk and uh, you've not disappointed and I'm sure everybody has been grateful for your um, interesting and uh, the panoramic view that you've given us of um, conservation in Zimbabwe over the um, hundreds of years, a couple of centuries, uh, if not uh, beyond. Um, we're coming to the close of our um, meeting, and I just wanted to ask team, team um, as Nobesutu has said, is the um, vice president of the chapter, to just give some concluding remarks before we all go our different uh, ways. Tim. First of all, um, thank you to everyone who for taking the time um, to join us um, this afternoon. Um, thank you particularly to Richard's mum. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited about working with people like Novosutu and MX and others um, as we build this chapter. Um, to be honest with you, we're, we're still a very young uh, organization, a young group. I'm not sure really what to call ourselves, um, professional society. Um, and we've all got full-time jobs, um, full-time studies. And so we really need each other's help in terms of um, building this chapter further. Um, I really like the way David ended his talk, um, thinking of alternative possible futures and also encouraging us as a chapter in terms of our vision. So thank you, David, for those thoughts. Um, I just wanted to, I'm aware some of you may have um, joined since we began and didn't hear Nobusutu's um, kind of excellent summary of what we're doing. Um, so just to let you know, a few months ago, we formed um, this chapter. We're under the Global Society for Conservation Biology, and we're a national chapter under that organization. And as I said, we're, we're relatively new as an organization. And I just wanted to highlight two things quickly. Um, I first wanted to share my screen. I'll see if I can do that. I think I can. Um, can you see my browser? Yes, we can see, see the screen. Great, thank you. So this, just to encourage you to visit our webpage, um, zimscb.org. Um, it's just zimscb.org. Um, and if you could just take a look at what we're about, um, better than me reading it all out here. But I would like to encourage you, if you'd like to be involved, um, please could you click the tab, take our survey, and that will take you to a page where you can give your insights and thoughts into, as to what you think we should be prioritizing going forward. So if you click the take the survey link, it will take you to a Google survey and you'll be able to tell us a bit about yourself, provide your details, and then most importantly, tell us the kind of things you'd like us to do, the ways we might serve the community of conservationists in Zim. Um, it should take about 10 minutes. Thank you so much for those here who have already completed that survey. We've had about 25 responses. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Um, that's the first thing I wanted to highlight is just um, the opportunity to get involved. Um, we do encourage people who join our national chapter to also join the Global Society for Conservation Biology. Um, there are There is a membership fee involved for that. Um, but we've decided as a committee that um, some people may not be able to afford those fees, and we still want to invite you to become um, involved in the chapter as friends of the chapter. Um, and so the first thing you can do if you're keen to get involved and have 10 minutes is please fill in that survey. That, that will then put you into our database and we'll be able to learn a bit about you and more importantly, hear your ideas. Um, and then just one last thing, and that is, an idea that Nobusutu had when we were having our first um, meetings as a, a newly formed committee, and that was the opportunity of doing a horizon scan. She, she touched on this. The idea behind this horizon scan is that we, and this is actually really fitting after what David has just said, um, it's really doing what David suggested, which is 
imagining alternative possible futures in Zimbabwe, trying to identify the things that are going to become increasingly important for conservation in the country. And normally these are things that are, are both novel, so they're things that are, are not perhaps very important right now, but will be in the future, so novelty is key, but also the likelihood of impact into the future. What are the kinds of things that are going to impact um, conservation in Zimbabwe, for example? Uh, one example might be, um, you know, this global outrage against trophy hunting. What, what will that mean for the future of conservation in Zimbabwe, which is so dependent on the hunting industry? Um, so for that, that process, just quickly, will involve um, Novasutu and the rest of us are still designing the plan, but it will involve um, seeking input um, from a large number of people, um, people just like you here on this call, to put in what you think are the emerging issues in conservation and then having a formal procedure for identifying and ranking those issues according to certain criteria and then writing it up as a document, kind of a, a manifesto for the future. Um, what are the issues we need to be thinking about? Because I think, um, as David mentioned, uh, winds of change. Um, there's, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the country, um, a lot that still needs to be done. But I think it, we are at a point of, of, of change and it'd be good to prepare for that. Um, what else did I have down here? Um, I think that's about it. Just to reiterate again, thanks to David. Um, and thank you so much guys for coming online and, and um, participating. And I think particular thanks to MX who um, arranged the seminar, he arranged the event, um, uh, first approach David. So thank you, MX. Um, I could just add a comment, if I may. Yeah. Go ahead, David. Um, I'd just like to congratulate you and your team um, and all of you for doing this. I think it's absolutely fantastic that you're putting together something like this. And um, I really wish you well. And if I can help you in any way, I'd be, be happy to do so. So really, it's great um, to see something like this developing. Fantastic. It's very encouraging, David, to hear that from you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Just want to say as well that we have recorded this and we will share with, uh, with many of you. Um, and um, we intend to have similar seminars uh, in the future. And some of you, I know you've been doing brilliant work. So please do approach us and let us know if you'd like to make a presentation about the work you're doing or you are interested in particular topics and we will try and, and work those uh, through into 2021. So it's only left for me to say thank you very much. We're going into this wonderful season of Christmas. I uh, hope all of you find some rest after a difficult year and please do keep safe and uh, in touch. So thank you very much to all of you uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye.